Kingdom of Men, Chapter 5, Favor The air was moist inside the forest, and the light trickled down on her through tiny holes in the treetops. The trees were not as thick as she thought they would be, and before long she found herself on an animal-beaten path. She kept stopping Maze briefly, holding them both still, as she tried to catch a glimpse or a sound of another dragot. A man would be quiet and hide in silence. She knew that it would be easier to track the dragot. After a short trek into the woods, she spotted a man standing beside a tree without a dragot. He appeared to be dressed in dark colors instead of the bright blue, green, and white of Lysodania. He had not noticed her and appeared fixated on a black metal object he was twirling around in his hand. Hey, she called out. Surrender now and your life will be spared. She maneuvered Maze carefully forward, not knowing if he was armed. But when she reached the area where he had been standing, he was gone. She turned her head, searching, and saw him again, deeper in the forest, but he appeared to be strolling casually. Kalia directed Maze toward the man, wondering how he had moved away from her so quickly. She drew closer and could see that he wore armor. Attached to the back of his armor looked like a pair of dragon wings. She kicked Maze and charged at him, sword raised slightly above her head, but he stepped behind another tree and was gone. She was suddenly dizzy, and tiny stars started to cloud the edges of her vision. She was confused about the feeling, since she wasn't holding her breath, had just eaten, and had drunk plenty of water. She wasn't one to feel light-headed for no reason. She shook off the strange physical sensation and tried to focus on locating her target. She couldn't tell how he was moving around so quickly, and he seemed to vanish every time she turned around. Suddenly, she heard a familiar sound. It was faint, but she was certain it was the same sound the dragons had made in her dream. It was like thunder, rolling over words, pushing them out toward her, desperate for her to understand. Kalia's head began to ache slightly at her temples, the stars growing bright across her eyes, blinding her. She dropped her sword and pressed her fingers to her head, trying to rub away the pain. More growl sounds entered her mind, rolling in and out of her eardrums, so loud they seemed to pound the inside of her forehead. She heard strange words mixed into growls that she couldn't understand. She closed her eyes tightly and fought back the urge to scream. Suddenly the voices stopped, and the pain vanished, as if it had never been there. She opened her eyes and heard Nicolette's voice through the woods. Kalia is in here. Be careful. Kalia, make yourself known. The soldiers will take it from here. Kalia, Nicolette said as he came into view. He sounded exasperated and immediately dropped his eyes to her sword laying at her dragon's feet. Her cheeks flushed with embarrassment and she slid down quickly from the dragon to pick up her sword. The soldiers will deal with anyone left alive, Kalia. We need to go report to the king. Amira is asking for you. Kalia remounted and nudged her dragon onward as she tried to maintain focus on her original objective. The soldiers were all around her now, coming into the forest. Nicolat rode up beside her and grabbed Maze's reins. He pulled hard enough to turn her dragon's head. Kalia's frustration at not being able to capture the rogue man was turning into anger toward Nicolat. Let go of my dragon! she snapped, trying to yank the reins back. A layer of ice passed across Nicolot's face, and for a moment she feared him. He bared his teeth like a beast and narrowed his eyes at her. Maze is not your dragot. She belongs to the royal family. He spoke slow and deliberately, enunciating every word. I am your prince, and I order you to go back to the princess, he said. I will let this insolence slide only once as you clearly are just some wild village girl with no concept of hierarchy. Kalia suddenly felt like a child being scolded. She ripped the reins loose from his grip and turned Maze around fast, coming side by side with Nicolot. After you, your highness, she said, not taking her eyes off his. He looked away and headed back to the castle lawns. Kalia reluctantly followed. 
Back on the lawn, there were 20 or so Bellarone soldiers standing guard around the princess, who had been coerced down from her dragget and was standing stubbornly with hands on her hips. When she saw her brother approaching, she pushed her way through the blockade of armor. Clea, thank the spirits! Where did you go? Amira asked. Amira stood beside Maze and ran her hands over the mare's golden coat, looking up sweetly at Kalia. She felt momentarily guilty for leaving the princess behind. I saw a fourth man in the woods, Kalia explained. I followed him for a few moments, but lost him. I'm sorry. Don't worry, Kalia. The soldiers will track him down. You were wonderful. I've never seen a woman fight like that before. The child princess seemed so small standing beside the dragon. Kalia had never had a sibling, but the protective instinct for this princess was growing stronger by the moment. How had those men snuck up on them? How could anyone want to harm this child? And why did they keep coming for her? Questions filled her mind as the young girl smiled up at her with a look of pride. Kalia smiled back, suddenly overcome by just how out of place she was here among soldiers and royalty, chasing assassins on a dragon. She had now saved this tiny, blonde-haired princess twice. Maybe there was something to this strange new place. Maybe she needed to be here. She looked over to Nicolot, who was discussing something with a soldier. He turned toward her absently, and their eyes met. Even after their exchange in the woods, his eyes seemed to carry more curiosity than animosity. Her heart rate increased and she dismounted, in order to walk alongside Amira back to the castle. She hoped that the young girl wouldn't be able to pick up on the tensions rising between herself and Nicolette. The soldiers formed a moving cocoon around the girls as they headed back to the castle. At the castle gates, the soldiers were replaced by a dozen royal guards who led them safely through the courtyard. Once inside the walls, they were escorted to the king's study. They could hear the king yelling from behind his closed doors. Do not tell me you don't know where they came from! he yelled. Then find out if it was Sarzo or McRoth and find out why they are after my children. The doors opened and General Zosef Array walked out, followed by two captains. The first was a thin, muscular man with sharp features and a long scar that ran the length of his face. The second man was young and handsome, with blonde hair and kind blue eyes. He glanced at Kalia and held her gaze as he passed them. Both men were dressed in red and white tunics, armor emblazoned with the dragon symbol of Bellarone Kingdom. The swarm of guards moved aside to let the general and soldiers pass, and then a few took the lead into the study. Princess Amira, holding Kalia's hand, pulled her into the study behind her, leaving the rest of the guards in the hallway. King Erasus was on his feet and moved quickly out from behind his desk. Amira, he said, wrapping his arms around her. The hug was brief, and so was the friendly tone in his voice. What were you thinking going near that forest? You shouldn't have left your brother's side. You had to run from the assassins. Do you realize what could have happened if you hadn't seen them coming? Sire, Kalia said, feeling protective. She responded swiftly and Prince Nicolot and I took care of the assassins. The king spun his angry face to Kalia, his cheeks red behind his gray and black beard. She gulped back any more defensive statements. And how could you let her leave your side? He asked, taking a step closer to her. Do you think it was prudent to kill those that might have been questioned so we could have found out who keeps attacking my daughter? He held eye contact for a few moments and Kalia wanted to tell him that it was Nicolot who had killed the last assassin, not her. But she kept frozen in place, barely breathing instead. Sit down, child, he said finally. Kalia lowered her eyes to look for the nearest chair and then quickly dove into it, grasping the wooden arms firmly for a sense of security. The king walked back to the far side of his large desk but did not sit. His desk was bulky and unadorned covered in papers, scrolls, and inkwells. The walls held overflowing bookshelves and hanging maps of Bellarone, Lysodania, and Exteli, all the kingdoms of Naldash. It was obviously just a room for working and never for entertaining. Kalia, he said. 
I am amazed to find myself once again in your debt for saving my daughter. He put his hands on the desk and leaned forward, looking at her. How do you come to know sword fighting, especially on Dragonback? We do not train women to do these things. My father taught me, your highness, Kalia said. The king drew his eyebrows closer together, considering that. Who is your father? Clegg Trapper, your highness? I do not know that family name Trapper. How would he have come by these skills? Was he a soldier? I do not know. Kalia spoke the words slowly, realizing that she did not know how her father had come by those skills, because she had never thought to ask. And you had dragots? Did you breed them? he asked. No, your highness. I had never seen one until I arrived in Bellarone. Riding her maze just seemed very natural. She didn't realize until the moment how easy it had been to knock down those assassins while riding a dragot at a full run. Surely those assassins had been trained at not only sword fighting, but also fighting on dragots. How had she dispatched them so easily? She was a third of their size, a young girl, and had not had the same type of training those men had surely received. Her eyes raised to meet the king's, and she realized he too was having the same thoughts. She hoped that he did not suspect her of somehow being a part of the assassination and kidnapping attempts. Her palms started to sweat. I am an old man, and I have seen a lot of things, he said, much calmer and quieter now. I have learned not to question everything, because some things go beyond our understanding. One thing I know I don't need to question is your loyalty to my daughter, young Kalia. An overwhelming sense of relief flowed through her. Just then the door swung open, and Prince Nicolas sauntered in. He gave a short bow to his father, then stood behind Princess Amira's chair, placing his hands on it. The king stood back up straight and looked at each of them before turning to look out the window behind him. The bright afternoon light cast him into silhouette while he spoke. Apparently the first kidnapping attempt was not the last. I am concerned for the princess's safety and require that she and Kalia both stay inside the castle until we can determine who is behind this and why. A small sigh escaped Amira's lips, and the king turned to her with a stern expression on his face. You are not to leave the interior of these walls, with or without escort, do you understand? Yes, father, she said, nodding with a mix of fear, obedience, and disappointment. She looked down at her hands, fidgeting with them in her lap. Guards, take the girls back to their rooms, he called loudly to the men behind the doors. Kalia flinched involuntarily at the sudden volume. The girls stood, and Kalia followed closely behind the princess, making very brief eye contact with Nicolot as she passed him. His expression was blank, so she tried her best to keep her face from revealing her own emotions. Her heart was racing, and when she looked down and saw the blood on her clothing, her mind began to replay the assassin's attacks. She could still hear the king's booming voice reverberating in her mind as she followed the guards down the corridors. This was far more than Kalia had ever expected when she had packed a small sack and headed out into the woods in search of her father. How have I gotten here? she wondered. Three guards escorted the girls to Amira's room. They opened the doors and Amira went in. Kalia hesitated in the threshold. I would like to be alone for a little while, Kalia said. Will you be okay without me? Amira nodded silently. Kalia gave her a reassuring smile, a quick bow, and then headed down the hallway to her own room. Two guards remained outside of Amira's door, while the third followed her to stand outside of her own. Kalia closed the heavy door, kicked off her boots, and shed off all the blood-stained clothing as quickly as she could. She slipped into a robe, walked to the giant bed, and fell onto it, face first. She curled up into a ball, wrapping the covers all around her. What am I still doing here, she wondered. It wasn't her responsibility to keep an eye on the princess or argue with the prince. This wasn't her life. She had to leave and find her father, and then they could return to the normalcy of her village. She pictured her father going back to the village, into their home, and not finding her. He'd be furious. 
She meant to find him and maybe save him from something, but instead she'd found and saved a child. She felt lost and hopeless. Although the sun was coming through her windows, she was overcome with exhaustion and fell into a light sleep. Her dreams kept taking her back to the attack on the lawn and the mysterious armored man in the trees. She was walking in circles around tree after tree in endless spirals through the woods. She heard a sound she knew was a dragon call. It was deep and low, reverberating all around her in the dark forest. Instead of a dragon, she caught glimpses of the armored man. Kalia couldn't recognize any colors. There were no crests to identify which kingdom he was from. The glimpses she caught grew longer and longer until she saw the man's armor was bronze in color with two metal wings that seemed to sprout from the backside of the armor. She couldn't tell if the wings were moving or if it was just the movements of the man wearing them. The closer she got to him, the louder the dragon calls grew. She was covering her ears now, running in circles in the woods, zigging and zagging around tree trunks. She was getting dizzy, and the sound was painful, like a beating in her head. A strange feeling began to overcome her, as if she was running toward safety instead of toward someone dangerous. Had she misjudged something, she wondered? Had she missed something? Kalia awoke to an incessant tapping at her door. She hadn't moved much during her sleep, but she noticed that the dragon calls were instantly quieted. She scrambled out of the bed, wrapping the robe tighter around her, and opened the door to find Flair, with her arms full of dresses, jewelry, and other things. You look a mess. This is going to take longer than I thought. Flair moved as if falling into Kalia's room. She dumped her armload onto a small sofa and spun toward Kalia. You'll first need to wash up. You have a big night ahead of you. The young woman smiled and clapped her hands together. A big night? Did something happen? Kalia didn't move from the door just in case she needed to make a hasty escape. Kalia, you have saved the life of the princess twice. You are a friend to her. She enjoys your company, and you are, well, a woman instead of a man. The king would much rather have a female guard protecting his daughter at every moment than a male guard, especially as she gets older. I don't understand, Falaire, Kalia said, sighing and leaning into the heavy door. The woman walked back toward her, pulled her off the door, and shut it heavily. Kalia was unsteady on her own feet. Her head was still clouded from sleep and every muscle in her body ached. Falaire huffed and walked back toward the clothing. The decision has been made. Tonight... The king will raise you to the status of a Bellarone favor and assign you as the personal guard to the princess. It is the highest appointment a non-royal woman has ever received. No, no, no. Kalia took a step back and waved her hands. I need to find my father and return home. I have to leave. I need to speak to... Who do I need to speak to? Folair lifted her already sharply pointed eyebrows even higher. There is no one you can speak to. The king will make his appointment tonight. Riders are already out calling the favor families in to attend. You will be honored with a ceremony binding you to the royal family forever. Kalia's legs began to weaken. I am a prisoner? Will I ever be allowed to return to my home? How can they do this to me? Her eyes began to burn with a threat of tears. You should be happy, Falair said. It's better than being a dressmaid or any kind of maid. You were just a villager, a farmer, and now you will be able to live in the castle and have whatever you desire. You'll be put into a much more lavish room next to Princess Amira's, living in complete luxury. But I love the woods, the outdoors, my home in Arion. Once the king allows it, you can teach the princess all about the outdoors. I had a home once, too, with my family, but this is our home now. It is an honor to your family to be selected to serve the kingdom, and you will have the highest honor bestowed on you, from farmer to favor 
You should be grateful. Now come on, we need to start getting you ready. Kalia just kept shaking her head back and forth in disbelief. Finally, Philair stormed over to Kalia, grabbed her shoulders, and shook her fiercely. Listen, if you do not accept this appointment, you will be seen as a traitor and will find yourself in a real prison. Though Philair had not shown much kindness to Kalia, she could hear the concern behind her warning. But her heart still pounded in her chest. This was so far from what she ever wanted. Maybe I can plead with Amira, explain. She knows I do not want to stay here, Kalia said, taking short, quick breaths. The princess is only ten years old. This decision is not hers. She can't do anything. Then I'll run away. Philair released Kalia's shoulders and crossed her arms, seeming to grow tired of the argument. Kalia had to steady herself, feeling weak. Yes, Kalia, you may run away, but you will be tracked, brought back, imprisoned, and executed. Who knows? You may even be blamed for the previous attacks on the princess. Your desertion will be seen as traitorous. I have been a servant here for many years, and I have seen terrible things and heard terrible things. This is not our world, Kalia. This world belongs to the king his sons, and his soldiers. For your life, you must do as they say. For any woman born in Bellerone, any woman born on Naldash, marriage to or a servant of the royal family is the best any woman can hope for. You will at least be one of the highest forms of servant. Kalia was silent for a long time, letting the few tears that had fallen evaporate from her cheeks. Valer gently took her hands and led her to the wash basin. She chattered on about the room she would be moving into, and how instead of basins there were large baths filled with warm water. Kalia let the young woman clean, dress, and style her. When Valer was finished, Kalia looked at herself in the mirror, but all she could see was a very lovely prisoner. Hours later, Kalia had finished picking at a small plate of food that had been brought to her in the early evening. No one other than Falaire had seen her, but she'd been given precise instructions not to leave the room until she was escorted to the ceremony that night. Kalia paced her room, watching her reflection in the mirror as she passed each time. She was in another red dress that flared out beneath the waist and had a slight train that trailed behind her. Instead of diamonds, white pearl beading ran down the back and sleeves. Folaire had chosen the dress, and she couldn't help wonder if the red was starting to represent the blood on her hands. Five men, dead. I had to, she said to her reflection. The sides of her hair were pinned back, simulating a thin crown while the rest of her brown hair hung low down her back. Folaire had clipped an ornate pearl clip into her hair, and a simple silver necklace with a single diamond trinket hung around her neck. Kalia looked more like a princess than a personal guard, in every way except for the blood red of the dress, reminding her that she was not delicate. There was a knock on her door, and she took a deep breath before opening it. She followed the house guard wordlessly through the halls until they reached a corridor that led to two large double doors that she knew opened into the throne room. The guard nodded, and she walked the length of the corridor to the doors alone. The massive wooden doors were carved with ferocious depictions of dragons wrapped in battle, claws digging into tough hides, pointy teeth bared. She suddenly felt faint and had to put her hand against a nearby wall to keep from falling over. My lady, are you unwell? The voice was a soft whisper. Kalia slowly opened her eyes and looked up into gentle blue eyes that seemed familiar. She realized that it was the young, handsome captain she'd passed going into the king's study after the assassination attempt. He had his arms outstretched as if preparing to catch her should she faint. The gesture made her want to give in to that feeling, faint, and let him catch her. The thought surprised her. I am very unwell, sir, she replied. He moved swiftly, 
putting an arm around her shoulders while holding her forearm with his other arm. Then he took her weight onto him and led her to an ornately carved wooden bench, gently setting her down on a tufted red cushion. He sat beside her, leaving his arm around her, and she laid her head against him. Are you all right? Tears began to sting her eyes and a hollow cramp filled her stomach. Her forehead ached with a strain of holding back tears. With everything going on around her, no one had asked how she was feeling. No one cared who she was or what she needed. I don't want to be here, she whispered. I want to find my father and go home. I have to leave. Kalia didn't dare look up at the stranger. She was embarrassed and couldn't believe she was telling all this to a Bellarone captain. But he squeezed her shoulder reassuringly. I understand and I'm truly sorry, he said gently. I don't know you or anything about the village where you are from, but it seems like you are here completely by accident. It may not seem fair to you that you are now being required to stay when you didn't come here seeking out this appointment, but you must accept this appointment a favor. If you refuse, he paused. I know, she said, lifting her head and straightening her shoulders. If I refuse, I'm choosing death. He turned his eyes to hers and squeezed her hand before letting it go and taking his arm from her shoulders. She felt the sudden loss of his comfort but knew that it was time. He stood up and extended his hand to her. I know that you will never be ready, so I won't ask you if you are, but will you allow me to escort you? She nodded her reply, and he helped her to her feet. He guided her arm into his and slowly began to lead her toward the doors. What's your name? She whispered. I am Captain Hillip Davin, he replied just as quietly. Thank you for your kindness, Captain Davin. He smiled in response. The guards on the other side of the doors opened them as they approached, and the captain escorted her into the throne room. Kalia was surprised by how many people were there. Everyone was lined up into neat rows on either side of a main aisle. They stared at her and put their fists to their chests as she passed. Flair had told her ahead of time that they would do this as a sign of respect and solidarity. Each of the Favor families had gone through a similar ceremony, but none of them were assigned to guard a member of the royal family. There were house guards and there were soldiers. The Favor families ran businesses to suit the kingdom's needs, provided a bloodline for heirs, and were wealthy landowners. It was unheard of, for an outsider, especially a poor villager, to be appointed to favor. Once she was within ten steps of the royal family, she stopped, as previously instructed. Captain Davin bowed, released her arm, and moved to stand along the crowd of favors. The royal family sat in front of her on their thrones. The king was in the middle, his two sons to his right, an empty throne for his deceased queen on his left, and Amira on the other side of her mother's empty throne. The chairs were encrusted with gold, but the fabric was a deep red. The backs were tall and covered with etchings of dragons in combat. Kalia took five more steps forward and directed her gaze to Amira. She curtsied toward the princess as Folaire had instructed, which made her feel very feminine and awkward. Then she rose and turned to Nicolot. His eyes seemed to penetrate her, and she feared for a moment all the instructions would vanish from her mind. But she peeled her eyes from his and curtsied, then moved again to curtsy to Prince Bilex. She took one more step forward and then curtsied deeply toward the king, spreading her skirts around her as she crouched. She held the position and kept her eyes and head focused on the marble floor. Loyal Bellarone Kingdom favors, King Erasus boomed across the throne room. Today we honor Kalia of Arion. She has twice proven herself not only loyal to the kingdom of Bellarone by saving the princess, but she has also shown tremendous skills in fighting. 
It is my wish and my command that she be appointed a favor of this kingdom and the personal guard to Princess Amira. If anyone here has just cause for why this honor should not be bestowed, please come forward. Kalia waited silently for the pause to end that she knew would only be interrupted by the frantic yelling in her mind. She dared not even move for fear the yelling would spill out of her. These witnesses have confirmed that Kalia is known to be honorable, loyal, and deserving of the title and duties she receives today. Rise, favor Kalia of Bellaron. May no man stand in the way of your duty to protect the life of the princess from this day forward. Kalia rose and remained in place so Captain Davin could approach and pin a round pendant to her dress. It was the pendant that all favors wore, a silver dragon encircling a red flame made from rubies. A respectfully subdued clapping filled the room. Captain Davin took her arm and escorted her out. That wasn't so terrible, he whispered, trying to give her a smile. She didn't return his smile, but she was thankful for his arm. It seemed to be the only thing keeping her from falling to the marble floor.